Hey everyone, thanks for coming out. Um, although this is not my first Black Eye talk, it is the first time I'll be speaking in person. I'm really excited to be here and uh, let's get started. So, a bit of background. Uh, my name is Bill Dimmerkuppe and I'm a researcher for the Microsoft Security Response Center. Uh, while working full-time, I'm also a full-time student at the Rochester Institute of Technology. I have a relatively diverse background in offensive and defensive security, but my specialization is low-level operating system internals, Windows being my favorite. So, in this talk, we'll be exploring my work into digital signatures, specifically the implementation issues I found with them. We'll start with some background on how digital signatures are validated. Then we'll look at approaches for attacking them, which will tie into the systemic flaw I found and its impact on the ecosystem. A quick disclaimer, we'll be discussing several first and third party vulnerabilities in this talk. Everything, everything you see here today are patched issues. We won't be dropping any zero days. So, how are digital signatures validated in the real world? A digital signature is used to verify that a message, document, or software comes from a specific sender and hasn't been altered during transmission. This is done by creating a hash of the message and then encrypting that hash with the sender's private key. A digital certificate, on the other hand, is a digital document issued by a trusted third party known as a certificate authority. It contains the public key corresponding to the sender's private key, as well as information about the identity of the sender. In order to validate a digital signature, the recipient needs to be able to find the sender's public key. The problem is, if the sender simply sent their public key along with their message, there's no way to know, for the recipient can know, uh, that the public key really belongs to the sender. By containing the sender's public key, and being digitally signed by a trusted third party CA, a digital certificate confirms that the public key really does belong to the sender. It's important to understand the role of trusted root certificate authorities. For digital signatures to work in practice, we need organizations that we can rely on to issue digital certificates and establish a chain of trust. Root certificate authorities are responsible for identity verification of individuals and organizations requesting a certificate. Who verifies the root CAs? Well, they come pre-installed. For example, the screenshot below is of the Windows Trusted Root Store. These are the authorities that come with the operating system and provide a reference point for digital signature validation. So how is a digital certificate verified? Through the chain of trust. Remember the trusted root CAs that come with your machine? We can verify if a digital certificate is legitimate by checking if it chains up to one of these trusted CAs. In practice, the root CAs verify intermediate CAs, which verify your end entity or server certificate and allow us to determine the legitimacy of a digital message. So let's go through a simplified example of what verifying an executable on Windows looks like under the Authenticode specification. First, we need to generate an Authenticode hash or a digest. We start by hashing the PE headers of the executable. We skip over some parts of the header, including the security directory and the checksum. Next, we sort every PE section by their file offset in ascending order and hash their contents. If there is any extra data after the PE sections and before the security directory, we'll include this into hash as well. Once we calculate the hash, we'll then grab the encrypted digest from the security directory, which contains the Authenticode signature. We decrypt and compare this hash with the one we calculated, and at this point, we've validated that the Authenticode signature is either valid or invalid. The last thing we need to do is verify the certificate and the chain of trust. Does the certificate link to a certificate authority we trust? And that's about it, at least from a high level. So let's talk a little bit about how one can go about attacking digital signatures. So a quick history recap. 
Since 1996, the use of the MD5 al algorithm has been discouraged due to its inherent weaknesses. For example, in 2004, we saw the public first publication of an MD5 collision. Researchers were able to generate two distinct files that resulted in the same MD5 hash. In 2008, researchers abused known MD5 weaknesses to generate a malicious intermediate certificate authority with a valid chain of trust. By using a chosen prefix collision, they were able to create this rogue intermediate CA that had the same MD5 hash as an end entity certificate that was issued by a legitimate certificate authority. In 2011, we saw the breach of the DigiNotor CA, and in 2012, we saw the flame malware abusing a very similar attack to the one we saw in 2008, which allowed them to generate a trusted Microsoft certificate authority. So let's discuss the attacks that are relevant for digital signatures. From a high level, at least. What types of attacks are relevant? We have three broad categories that are generally applicable to a lot more than just digital signatures. Let's break these down. First, we have memory corruption issues. These are your classic out-of-bounds read and write vulnerabilities or overflow vulnerabilities that can often arise from mishandling untrusted data. How do we find them? Typically, this involves manual or guided analysis, as well as fuzzing. How do we fix them? Well, one good way is to minimize your attack surface, limit the code that processes untrusted data. You can also use various mitigations and memory safe languages uh, to substantially reduce your risk for these issues. Next, we have logic flaws. These are highly context specific implementation issues that vary by application. How do we find them? Again, manual or guided analysis, fuzzing, fuzzing et cetera. And these issues typically require a decent understanding of how the application is supposed to work and the intended usage. For example, a good way to find these issues is to look for differences in logic between a design document and the actual implementation. How do we prevent them? Well, again, minimizing the code that processes untrusted data is a good place to start. Absolutely look for a secure design. And also, having a test suite of expected outcomes are another way to prevent regressions and validate basic assumptions. We also have cryptographic flaws. These are different from implementation issues in that they exist in the cryptographic algorithms themselves. How do we find them? Again, this typically involves mathematical analysis of algorithms to ensure things like pre-image resistance, uh, second pre-image resistance, and strong collision resistance. And for preventing them, for most people, just don't roll your own crypto. So logic flaws are one of the harder types of vulnerabilities to address. Writing cryptographic systems is inherently challenging due to its complexity. Cryptographic implementations aren't isolated. They interact with a multitude of other systems, protocols, and software. Patching implementations can get complicated. For example, one reason why XYZ insecure future, you know, a future we know has security issues, is difficult to get rid of is because if you simply prevented its use, you may break legacy systems and applications. Memory corruption issues are better, are better understood. Um, logic flaws are harder to prevent as they are context specific. Let's review the different types of signing certificates and the minimum requirements for obtaining them. First, we have regular SSL certificates that you can use to secure your connection with a web server. At minimum, you need to prove that you own the domain you are requesting a certificate for. This can involve adding a DNS record or uploading a file to serve via HTTP. SMIME certificates are used for securing email communications. Like SSL certificates, you need to prove that you own the email address that you're requesting a certificate for, which can include the identity uh, of yourself or your organization. We also have code signing certificates. These are used to maintain the integrity of your software. Unlike SMIME or SSL certificates, the bar for obtaining one is substantially higher. As we'll soon discuss, you will almost always need to verify your identity or the legitimacy of your organization. Finally, we also have document signing certificates. 
These are in a bit of a gray area as they're frequently interchangeable with SMIME or SSL certificates and have similar requirements. The requirements for different types of certificates can greatly vary. Let's break down the different types of validation that CAs can perform. With domain validation, you need to prove that you, con that you control a given domain. This is a pretty low bar for verification because only your domain is validated. And because of the lower levels of verification, there is a higher risk of abuse. Organization validation is where we get into a moderate level of verification. During this process, you need to prove the legal and physical existence of your organization. This is often the bare minimum uh, for code signing certificates and other sensitive digital signature use cases. Extended validation is one of the highest levels of validation that a CA can perform. It's everything you need for OV or organization validation, but more. For example, you often need to show that your business is legitimate and not a shell company. So, when I started my research into digital signature implementations, the differences between certificate requirements caught my eye. For example, in our context, having a valid digital signature alone is not sufficient. We need to not only be able to verify that a signature is cryptographically valid, but also that it originates from a trusted source. These two diagrams overview the differences between extended validation and domain validation. The question I had was looking at the extended validation process, which is significantly more t tedious than the domain validation process, is what prevents an attacker from abusing a certificate that has only proven domain ownership for purposes that require a higher level of verification, like code signing. So we know that the DV certificates or domain validated certificates can be used for SSL certificates, for example. And we know that organization validation or extended validation is necessary for code signing certificates. What's stopping an attacker from using one of these certificates that has a much lower bar of identity verification for an unintended purpose. Now let's get into the fun stuff. So what defines a certificate's purpose? What distinguishes an SSL certificate from a code signing certificate? Often, it's the extended key usage field present in most end entity certificates. EKUs specify what a certificate is allowed to be used for. As an example, the image on the right shows this field from an SSL certificate. The server and client authentication usages mean that the certificate is allowed to authenticate a remote server or client. But what actually verifies these EKUs in practice? When you sign digital data, the utility you use can impose restrictions. For example, if you're signing an executable, you may receive an error if you try to use a certificate without the code signing EKU. These, the restrictions these tools impose are not what matters because they run before the attack is performed and on an untrusted environment. As we'll soon see, if I, as an attacker, got an error related to the intended purpose of my certificate, there's nothing stopping me from modifying the tool to bypass this check. So how do we identify vulnerable implementations that fail to validate a certificate's intended purpose? First, we started by identifying some basic criteria. Now, the Microsoft Security Response Center is interested in protecting the entire ecosystem, not just first-party implementations. We ended up looking at a variety of file formats that leverage digital signatures. Most frequently, this included code signing because of the bare minimum organization validation requirement. For testing, we generated an SSL certificate which only required proof of domain control. So in the next few slides, we'll review the signing tools relevant to the file formats we're interested in and modify them to remove any client-side checks. Remember, modifying our signing tools comes before any attack, and it's on our environment. What matters is how the receiving end handles these EKUs. 
So to start with, I looked at Microsoft's sign tool, which lets you, uh, which lets you sign over 25 unique extensions. This utility is most often used for authentic code formats, and it comes with the Windows SDK. First, I performed a sanity check and tried to sign an executable with my SSL certificate. As you can see, sign tool by default does, not, does validate the EKUs of your signing certificate, and you're not allowed to use an SSL certificate to sign an executable. We need to get around this. So using IDA Pro, I was able to quickly identify the function responsible for the check by looking for the EKU filter error string. The function was conveniently named filter certificates, and I patched it to immediately return and avoid filtering entirely. Next time I tried signing my executable, it worked without a problem. I now had an exe file that was signed with an SSL certificate. Sign tool isn't the only utility relevant to this project. The manifest generation and editing tool is used to create and modify application or deployment manifests. Part of this tool includes the ability to actually sign these manifests. We'll discuss how these are used in practice in a later slide. Like sign tool, Mage performs EKU verification when signing a manifest. Unlike sign tool, Mage is written in C sharp. How, do we, how can we patch this EKU check? I used YenSpy, an older .NET assembly editor that allows you to decompile C sharp applications and then modify them. I found the responsible method can sign with by looking for the relevant error message. Using DNSPY, I modified this method to always return true. As expected, this modification allows you to sign manifests with an unrelated certificate that does not have a code signing EKU. Now that we've prepared our test data signed with our SSL certificate, let's try it against real world authentic code implementations. Some background. On Windows, the primary API commonly used to verify the trust of supported objects is WinVerifyTrust. This function abstracts the job of signature validation to subject interface packages, or SIPs, and trust providers. SIPs are responsible for the format-specific verification of digital signatures. For example, a portable executable will store digital signatures in a different format compared to a PowerShell script. There's a SIP for both, and in this talk, we'll briefly review this architecture. If you're interested in understanding this design in detail, I would strongly recommend that you read Subverting Trust in Windows by Matt Graber. So trust providers don't care about the SIP you use. They are designed to perform format agnostic trust verification actions. Common trust providers include WinTrust Action Generic Cert Verify, which will verify a certificate, Generic Chain Verify to verify the chain of trust, Generic Verify, which is used to verify a file or object according to the authentic code specification, and the Generic Verify provider is most commonly used for a lot of the formats we see. Um, but it's also used in some other formats that are supported, that have SIPs that support it. So, as a simple test, I wrote a small application to verify an executable with Win Verify Trust. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, it didn't work. I received an error stating the certificate is not valid for the requested usage. Remember the generic verify trust provider? Unfortunately, it turns out that one of the basic requirements for this provider, which is used for quite a few different formats, is that the code signing EKU is present. This meant that most of these formats that are verified through this architecture are protected by default. Although Windows may have gotten it right for once, I was curious about other libraries that validated the authenticity of Authenticode's applications. 
What about the workloads that need to verify these signatures on other operating systems? Well, unfortunately, as we'll soon see, several authentic code implementa implementations outside of Windows itself were vulnerable to this attack. So, the Mono project is an open source equivalent of Microsoft's .NET framework. Microsoft sponsors the project, and Mono is frequently used in cross-platform applications that want to use .NET. Mono supports Authenticode signing and verification with its Authenticode deformatter and Authenticode formatter classes. How can we test Mono's Authenticode implementation? Well, fortunately, Mono comes with a check trust tool that allows us to verify the signature of an executable. Unfortunately, due to a lack of EKU validation, Mono's Authenticode deformatter class is vulnerable to the attack. Now, this issue isn't just specific to Mono's simple check trust testing utility. Any Mono application that uses this, this class for verifying untrusted executable is potentially vulnerable. Moving on to our next issue. Trail of Bits is a security consulting firm that helps organizations engineer secure applications. They have quite a few open source tools and projects, one of which includes Authenticode. Authenticode is a cross-platform library that allows you to verify the digital signature of a portable executable. The intent is to provide a similar interface, like WinVerify Trust, on non-Windows platforms. Unlike WinVerify Trust, however, Authenticode does not verify the chain of trust. It only verifies the signature. The chain of trust is not relevant for EKUs, however. You can verify that a LEAF certificate is allowed to be used for code signing without verifying that it was used by a, issued, without verifying that it was issued by a trusted authority. Unfortunately, Authenticode was vulnerable to the EKU hack allowing attackers to sign code with an unrelated certificate. Fair disclaimer, the re real world implications of this EKU attack with Authenticode are limited. For example, according to the authors I spoke with, Authenticode is frequently used in CI CD stacks for basic Authenticode validation. Of course, given its open source nature, it's hard to quantify its use with certainty. I also wanted to quickly review a bonus example. So when I was reviewing Authenticode's implementation of signature verification, I noticed that it deviated from the specification. On the left, we have the same diagram from the earlier slide showing a high-level overview of what verifying a portable executable looks like. On the right, I've modified the diagram to reflect Authenticode's implementation of the specification. According to the Authenticode specification, you are supposed to hash the contents of an executable by concatenating the hashes of the PE header, sorted PE sections, and any extra data. Authenticode ignored PE sections. Instead, they'd hash the PE header and the rest of the file, excluding the security directory. On an earlier slide about attacking digital signatures, I mentioned how you shouldn't roll your own crypto or deviate from the specification. I was curious, what were the, impl what were the implementation, what were the implications of these differences? Unfortunately, this deviation led to a pretty big flaw. I found that by embedding the security directory within a PE section, I could modify the code of an executable without changing its Authenticode hash according to Authenticode. The problem was that since Authenticode skips over the security directory, it would hash everything up to the PE section, ignore the security di directory with malicious code, and hash everything after it. You could move around the security directory, and the Authenticode hash as calculated by Authenticode would not change. I was able to leverage this, this attack to replace the entry point of a legitimate Microsoft executable with malicious shellcode. 
this issue is not related to EKUs. It was simply an extra implementation flaw I stumbled upon. But it highlights the importance of sticking with the specification and how one small mistake with digital signatures can have a devastating impact. Let's discuss click once. Click once is a deployment technology that allows developers to create self updating Windows applications that can be installed and run with minimal interaction. Under the hood, ClickOnce deployments are made up of application files, a deployment manifest, and an optional application manifest. The cool part of ClickOnce is that you can install or run applications from a website. The picture shows what a ClickOnce prompt can look like, which can be triggered by a link in a browser that supports ClickOnce. So, ClickOnce applications can be signed automatically with Visual Studio or manually with Mage. What does that look like? Well, for Visual Studio, it'll start by taking your unsigned ClickOnce deployment, it'll sign the application manifest and the application files directory, the deployment manifest in that same directory, and the application manifest in the root directory. So, once the deployment was signed, which I, again, I used the SSL certificate for and the mage tool we modified earlier, I uploaded it to a web server for testing. This is, again, what the prompt looks like. The web page can be whatever you want, but if you hit that run button or open button, you'll now see uh, the click once security warning. And unfortunately, uh, click once was impacted by the attack. Uh, by signing a click once deployment with, a with an SSL certificate, I was able to generate a deployment that was legitimate and the eyes of click once. So I want to talk a little bit about some related work from other researchers. In 2014, researchers from the University of Texas and the University of California released Using Frankincert for Automated Adversarial Testing of Certificate Validation in SSL slash TLS implementations. So as the name suggests, the researchers generated mutated certificates with different combinations of extensions and constraints. The idea was to look for inconsistencies across implementations. Now, the paper exclusively focuses on testing the SSL slash TLS implementations in OpenSSL, NSS, GNU TLS, et cetera. Of relevance to this talk, the researchers found several libraries that failed to validate the appropriate EKU. Instead of malformed certificates for digital cert signatures and executables, they looked at abusing them in the browser. If you'd like to read more about their work, check out the GitHub link below. We additionally verified that common, common libraries like OpenSSL validate EKUs appropriately. So if you use these libraries for solely auth verifying the authenticity of a certificate without specifying a purpose, and there's no default, you can still be exposed to an EKU attack. In OpenSSL, you can specify a context for X509 verification, which can include EKU defaults. You can see an excerpt in the code below where the EKU default is set by simply specifying that you're an SSL client or an SSL server. Additionally, outside of the formats we reviewed in this talk, there are quite a few that didn't work. I cut them out for time, but there's quite a few implementations outside of the ones we covered that were not impacted by the EKU confusion attack. All right, let's review some takeaways and techniques. So let's review the attack. In this project, we discovered numerous implementations of digital signatures that failed to validate the extended key usage field. This would allow an attacker to abuse certificates with a substantially lower bar for identity verification in important contexts like code signing. You can see in the diagram below what this attack looks like. 
we start by an attacker generating an SSL certificate or another low cost certificate that doesn't have a high bar of verification. Next, the attacker assigns the unrelated data with the mismatched certificate. Vulnerable apps fail to detect the invalid certificate and this can lead to a false sense of trust for the user or other bypasses of important access controls. How do you protect your implementation? Well, if you're impacted by this attack, which you should verify if you have a digital signature implementation that works on untrusted data, you should start with a point fix. Always validate EKUs in your application to ensure that certificates are used for their intended purpose. You can use libraries that properly implement these EKU checks. OpenSSL, as an example we briefly reviewed earlier, allows you to specify a context for your client and it'll automatically have defaults for an EKU associated with it. Trust but verify key principles in your application's design. Every single vulnerable implementations we re review today were supposed to check for EKUs. No one verified that they did. Implement regular security testing, especially in components using cryptography for crucial features. Your implementation is much more likely to have a vulnerability than a cryptographic algorithm. What is MSRC doing to protect our customers? Well, we've released a patch for all first party issues. The third party issues we discussed in this talk have also been fixed. We're continuing to work with impacted third party vendors to address their implementations. And we continue to explore digital signature implementations for similar flaws. Below is a list of CVEs that were recently issued for some of these vulnerabilities. That concludes my talk. I really appreciate everyone coming out. And now is the time for questions.